Hello everybody, welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner. We're covering section three of chapter six of Sergey Lang's Basic Mathematics. Chapter six, of course, is all about congruence. That's right, congruence. And section three, we're gonna talk about how you can take isometries and put them together and create new isometries. So his example in the first paragraph here, he talks about taking isometries in succession, one after the other. So you could imagine an isometry that's uh, rotation through an angle of 30 degrees, and then you, you take the reflection through a line, and then you rotate it 45 more degrees. Such a, such a isometry is composed of several parts. And so that's a word that we're going to use. Compose means to take different things and put them together. A composition is something that is built from many parts. And in a way, addition and subtraction, multiplication, division, those are all kind of compositions. Like the number 6 times 3, which is 18. 18 can be thought of as a composition of 6 and 3 multiplied together. So anyway, moving right along, let's talk about the general case. So when we have the situation where you take a, P, a point P and you apply it through two isometries one after the other. So first you apply it to G and then to F. This itself is uh, also an isometry. Um, the reason why we know that is because distance is preserved through the first isometry mapping and distance is still further preserved by the second isometry mapping. And a shorthand for this isometry is F uh, circle G. So we apply the one on the right first and then we apply the one on the left second. And when you actually apply that to a point, it looks like this. So you take f of g of p and you write it out like this. So the one on the right goes on the inside of the one on the left. Okay. All right. Uh, as an example, um, let's consider the rotation f that is 90 degrees with respect to O. Um, and let g be a, a, a reflection through O. So f is a rotation. 90 degrees through O, or centered on O, I guess is the way they put it. And G is a reflection through O. Okay? So, if we were to take F um, and we were to apply it twice, so F and apply it twice, what's happening is all of these points, let me draw what that looks like here. Let's use my compass to draw a nice little circle that's handsome. So here's a circle. Hopefully that shows up well. It does indeed show up well. So let's take O, this is green. This is O. And so what's happening when we take this rotation of 90 degrees? So if we had a point here, we'd go over here. This would be F of P. This is point P. And then applying F twice, we would get F of F of P. Right? And if we took some other point, let's use a different color. Let's use this light blue. So over here we have, let's say, Q. Then F of Q would be over here. And F of F of Q would be over here. Hundred. Well, hold on a second. This is more like over here is F of Q. I should be very careful about these angles. Yes. So F of Q is 90 and then 180 is over there. And so the reflection of these points always go through the center. And so we know that F of F is also the reflection G. Those are the same isometries. Remember that we can prove that um, mappings are the same if for every point in the plane maps the same through those things. So because we know that uh, F of F of every point P is the same as G of P for all P, then we know that this is an isometry. All right. Uh, we, we know that these are actually the same isometries, is what I was trying to say. All right, let's, uh, let's see what happens when we take an isometry and compose it with the identity. It should be relatively obvious what's going to happen, but uh, let's do it anyway. We have orange, a light orange. Hopefully this shows up well on camera. So let's take F, some isometry, and let's compose it with the identity. The identity doesn't change the points, right? So this is the same as F applied to the identity applied to any point. I'm sorry. This isn't the same as. This is, if we applied it to any point, then we, that's the same as f of p, which basically says that this mapping of i is the same as f for every point p. If we did it the other way around, right, so we would have i applied to f of some point p, and no matter what we do to that point, it's going to be the same point. And so for every point p as well, 
i of f is also equal to f. So we have f of i is equal to i of f is equal to f. So identities behave just like they do in multiplication and addition in algebra. All right. Composition of rotations. Let's take rotations and apply them in succession one after the other and see what happens. So uh, first we're going to define, um, we're going to need to define rotations through a number of systems. We've already used a rotation through point O with a given angle, but let's say that F and G, um, so F and G are rotations. And they are rotations through the same point O. Okay, so they use the same central point, uh, relative to O or whatever they use it for that terminology. So you let O be a given point and let R be a number greater than zero. So R is a number greater than zero, it's a number. And we're going to have P and Q distinct from O. They might be the same points themselves, but they're ne definitely not O, okay? And so it's because it's distance preserving, then uh, the distance from point P to O is the same as the distance from F of P to O, because O doesn't change through the rotation. And this, it goes the same through uh, G of P, right? So these distances don't change through the rotation, okay? So we can define um, some rotation G. We're gonna use P and Q. This is a rotation through the point O such that when you apply it to P, you get Q, okay? And this, in fact, this is a unique rotation. There is no other different and distinct rotation that would do this and, and be different and distinct. So no matter what you choose, uh, uh, when you're given P and Q, there's only one rotation that'll do this, okay? And there's a curious property here that if we compose the rotation QM that will take a point Q, move it to point M, with the rotation PQ, you're going to get the rotation PM. And how do we know that? Because if we take uh, GQM composed with GPQ and plug in P, then that's the same as saying G of QM with G of PQ on the inside taking P which is the same as G of QM, and point P through GPQ is going to give you Q, and then point Q through GQM is going to give you M. And so you start at P, you end up at M, and so this rotation must be the same as GPM, okay? In terms of numbers, we can also describe rotations with numbers, okay? So let X and Y be numbers. By numbers, we mean real numbers, of course. So we define g of x to be the rotation uh, relative to O of x degrees. Okay, and this is counterclockwise, counterclockwise, CW. Okay, so if we took g of x and compose it with g of y, what do we get? Well, that would just be like rotating through a total angle of x plus y. For example, if we had a rotation of 40 de 45 degrees, and then we did it again, rotation of 45 degrees, that's the same as rotating by 90 degrees total, okay? On the other hand, if we had a rotation of um, 270 degrees, and we then rotated it by 180 degrees, that's going to be the same as rotating by 450 degrees. 450 degrees, if you recall, is the same as rotating by 90 degrees. Okay, because 360 plus 90 is 450. So you're going around the circle once and then a little bit more, but you're ending up with the same thing at the end. All right, let's talk about translations. What happens when we compose translations? So composition of translations. So we can uniquely describe a translation um, as follows. So a translation TPQ is a translation such that uh, TPQ of P will give you Q. So it's identified by the point P moving to Q through this translation. All right. And you can probably figure out that if you compose two translations, first moving P to Q and then Q to M, that's the same as starting at P and ending up at M. So those two translations are the same. And indeed, Translating from the same point to the same point is the same as doing that. nothing at all. 
Okay, pretty simple. There's really not much more to discuss about translation. So we'll move on to associativity of isometries. All right, let's get some more paper. Associativity of, of of isometries. Uh, recall that associativity is the property uh, with basic numbers that says this. It says when you're adding three numbers in succession, adding the first two or adding the second two, you'll still get the same result. And when you're doing it with multiplication, it doesn't matter which ones you do first, it's the same. So the question is, is it true that f of g of h is the same as f of g of h. In order to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to apply these translation, these uh, isometries to arbitrary points. So we're going to take f of g of h applied to p. What does that mean? Well, we take the f of g, and then we put inside of that h, of h applied to p, right? And so what does this mean? This means you take f and apply it to g and apply it to p. All right, let's walk through that. It's a little bit confusing. It's important that you see this. Okay, so this notation, recall that uh, f of g of p is the same as f of g of p, okay? So in this case, the g, the f is the f of g part, right? So that part stays the same, just like f goes to f here. The h, the circle h, goes on the inside of the left-hand side. So this g goes on the inside there, and the p is applied to g first. Okay, And then we do that again, the f goes to the outside, and this g goes there, and all of this stays the same on the inside of g. Okay, If we do it on the other side, do the opposite way. We have f uh, of g of h applied to p. And so what does that become? So that's going to be f applied to g of h of p. And then what does that mean? That's f of g of h of p. Okay. So in this case, we did it in a slightly opposite order. So f stays there. I'm sorry. The f goes there. This part all goes on the inside of that. Right? That doesn't change. This part goes there, and all of this goes on the inside of g. And you'll note that for any point p, these two things are the same. And that's why we know that the associative property applies, which is why we will write it as f of g of h like this, because it doesn't matter which side you do first. All right. What happens if you apply the same isometry multiple times? So if we have f of f, we call that f squared. All right, this should harken back to what you learned already with algebra. And if we do it three times, that's f cubed. And in fact, we will say that if you have f applied to f n times, and that's just f to the n. And this only works for positive integers. We'll get to negative integers uh, in the next section, but for now, we'll just focus on positive integers. Okay? All right, so let's take an example. And this is a really interesting example. This one's fun. Let g be the reflection through the point, given point O, through O, point O, which is a point, okay. Then we see that if we take G and apply it to itself, what does that do? Well, we're reflecting twice. So once it moves through O and then it moves back. And so this basically does nothing. So G squared is equal to I. G cubed, that's gonna be G times G times G, or G of G of G. So the g of g is, is the identity, and identity of g is all just g, is just g. Let me write that out for you. So g of g of g. So this part becomes i of g. i of g is just g, because when you apply the identity, nothing happens. g to the fourth is the identity again. g to the fifth is g, and in fact, you'll see that g to the n is either g or i. g when n is odd, and i when n is even, okay? So that's interesting because we don't have this property multiplication where if you multiply a number by itself, you can get back to the identity. But here we do have it in reflections. What if we applied this to rotations of 90 degrees? Okay, so let's let F is a rotation of 90 degrees. Right? What's F squared? 
that's two rotations of 90 degrees, or that's a rotation of 180 degrees, right? What about f cubed? That's three rotations of 90 degrees, or a rotation through 270 degrees, and f to the four, that's a rotation through 360 degrees, which is the identity. And f to the fifth, that's the same as, as just going rotating once, so that's the same as f, and f to the sixth is f squared, f to the seventh is f to the third, f to the eighth, that would be the same as f to the fourth, which is the identity again. And so you can see f to the n is going to be one of these four options. I mean, f, i, f, f squared, or f cubed, depending on uh, what the remainder is after you divide n by four. Okay, this is another interesting property of rotations when you apply them to themselves. Again, you have like this closed loop where you're coming back to the origin. It takes four turns to do it, but you can see how that works. And you can see how rotation of one degree would take 360 times to get back to the same and stuff like that. Very, very interesting property. In fact, uh, we're going to define for an isometry, if we take f to the zero, any isometry f to the zero, we're just gonna define that as the identity. Okay, it makes sense especially in light of what we learned here. And we're gonna have this additional rule that f to the m composed with f to the n, that's the same as applying f to the m plus n times. And this should be relatively obvious why this is so. All right, so we're going to take as a final example, let's suppose t is a translation one inch to the right. So t squared, what would that be? That would be a translation two inches to the right, and t cubed would be the translation three inches to the right, and t to the square, t squared composed with t cubed, that's the same as t to the fifth, this is a translation to five inches to the right, okay? That's fairly basic. The exercises here, I, I don't want to spoil the fun, I think if I give any hints I'll give away too much. Um, I want you to get used to this, this, uh, this new notation that we're using, so when you study the exercises, recall what this really means. Recall that when you take and compose two isometries together and you apply that to some point, that's the same as this. This should help you, guide you through the rest. Uh, the other exercises, a lot of it has to do with proving proofs and having fun in that direction. Guys, thanks for your time. Take care and bye-bye. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. This video is part of my series on Sergey Lang's basic mathematics. You can click here to watch the rest of the videos in the playlist. You can click here to learn more about me, and you can click here to support my channel. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.